Welcome to another exciting podcast from Living Faith Church. It's our hope and prayer that today's message will bring you closer and deeper to the heart of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now here is our lead pastor, Pastor Dean Hackett. Daniel was a Hebrew young man growing up in the city of Jerusalem. I'm talking about the same Daniel that wrote the book of Daniel that's in the Old Testament. But when the Babylonian Empire and King Nebuchadnezzar conquered Judah and ravaged the city of Jerusalem, they took several of the elite young men. Some were royalty, some were from leading citizens, but they took these elite young men to the capital of the Babylonian Empire and forced them into culture training and uh, correct political thinking because they wanted these young men to rise up as government leaders and some level of the Babylonian government. Daniel was among those taken. When they arrived into the empire and the capital, they were put under training. Daniel revealed that he was not only a leading member, young man in the city of Jerusalem, but he was a leader among young men. And he purposed in his heart he was not going to defile himself, that he would maintain his kosher style. He would not compromise his walk with God. And three other young Hebrew men partnered with him. Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah followed Daniel's example, and they agreed to partner with him in maintaining their kosher lifestyle. And so Daniel, being the leader that he was, he appealed to the master over those being trained and said, look, we want to maintain our kosher lifestyle. He said, I I can't afford that. If, if, If you appear weaker before the king, it's gonna be my neck. He goes, no, 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 you don't understand. If we honor God, he'll honor us. And so he agreed to give them a test. Well, at the end of that test, they were wiser, more healthy than the other young men. And so he let them go throughout their training with that. And when they stood before the king and were examined by the king, the king found Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah to be 10 times wiser and 10 times more healthy than all the other men. And so they were given special promotion as leaders within the Babylonian government. But it didn't stop there for Daniel. When Darius became king and the Persian Empire swallowed up the Babylonian Empire, and under Darius, Daniel continued to be a leader in the government. And King Darius found Daniel to be such an elite leader and a man of wisdom that he put him as one of three of the governors over the regional, 120 regional governors. But not only that, he began to see such leadership quality in Daniel and such wisdom in Daniel that he wanted Daniel to be the governor of the governors. And uh, when word began to get out about that, the other two governors began to be jealous, right? Okay, part office politics. They began to be jealous, and they went, we can't have this. And then they doubly didn't like it because he was a Hebrew. He was a Jew. And they went, no way we can have a Jew over us. This is no way. And so they began to plan how they could take Daniel down. And a part of their plot was, you know what? We, we got to find something where we can legally accuse him. And they began searching, I mean, 
You talk about digging. Does this sound familiar? Politics hasn't changed much in 2,000, 3,000 years, has it? They began searching and digging dirt, okay, right? And they went to, I'm going to modernize this. They went to all the media, and they said, dig, dig, find something with this guy. Came back, and they said, we can't find anything. This guy's integrity is squeaky clean. We can't find anything. Said, well, if we're going to make an accusation, it's going to have to be about his service to his God, because he's always talking about his God. He's always serving his God. So they went, we know. We'll make it a law in the land that you can only have emperor worship. And you can only pray to the king. And we'll establish emperor worship. And so they went to Darius. Darius, not knowing what their plot was all about, went, I like that. Yeah, come worship me. And so he signed it into law. You can only pray to the emperor. You can only pray to the king. Daniel would not compromise. Don't you love having a godly man that will not compromise? In our generation, when I think of a godly man that never compromised, I can't help but think of Billy Graham. Amen. There was more than one time the media thought they were going to take him down and they searched him out and they couldn't find anything. When Dr. Graham was in his senior years, he wanted to have an authorized biography written. There had been several biographies written by that time I had read, I think, all of them. But he wanted to have an authorized biography. And he went to what he considered the leading author in our nation who had written, already written several best-selling <laughs> volumes that were biographies. And he invited him to his home there at Montreat North Carolina and talked with him about it and uh, uh, when he agreed that he would, he would write the biography, Billy said to him, but there are three things that you are required and what I'm saying to you right now is in the introduction to the book. The author wrote about it himself and he said, when Billy said that I thought, oh here we go. Because this man was not a believer. In fact, he was probably an agnostic. Billy looked him in the eye and said, there are three things if you're going to do this. One, you have to tell the absolute truth, the good and the bad that you find. Number two, nothing will be hidden. And number three, we're opening all the records to you at the Billy Graham Association. You can search it all out. The finances, all the records, you can search it all out. You will tell the whole truth. This non-Christian man was staggered by the integrity of Billy. He entitled the volume, A Prophet with Honor because he was staggered by the integrity of Dr. Graham. What a great testimony. Amen? Amen? But see, that's what God's looking for, sir, right now in America. He's looking for men that will have integrity, and integrity is what you do when no one is looking and no one is listening. What you do in the secret hours. And I'm saying to you right now, in your secret hours, if you're on the computer and you're looking at stuff that you know you had not to be looking at, God wants to get a hold of your heart and set you free so that you have a heart of true integrity. If you talk and you use words and language when you're by yourself, 
when nobody else is listening and when other Christian brothers are not around. God wants to get a hold of your heart and he wants to make you a man of integrity because we need men of integrity that will rise up in leadership in our business community, men that will rise up in leadership in all areas of our community, in all areas. We got to have men of integrity that's leading this nation. Godly men, men who will not compromise no matter what. And I want to tell you, the further we go down this road we're on right now, standing for Jesus is going to become more and more politically incorrect. Look at what's going on in our neighbors. I had someone send me a note and said, can you believe what's happening to that pastor in Canada? I wrote back, and I said, what most Americans have not understood over the years is that Canada has always been socialist. The five years we were up there, we saw the socialism in all of its fullness. Their laws are very different from ours. And we tend to think that because, you know, they're like we are, we speak the same language and da-da-da, we're just alike. Oh, no. Canada's always been socialist. And now, over the last decade, they've been on a socialist bullet train. And that's why you see the stuff that's going on in Canada right now to the churches. Churches being burned. You're seeing pastors being arrested, put in jail. Folks, listen. We got to understand. I thank God for these men of God who will not compromise, who will stand, who will stand. Daniel was a man who would not compromise. And so he opened his window towards Jerusalem and he prayed three times a day as he always did. Daniel was a man who prayed three times a day throughout his lifetime. Of course, these these accusers saw him praying. So he was arrested. He was brought before the king, found guilty. He didn't compromise. You're right, king. I'm not going to pray to a human being. I'm not going to pray to someone who's a man just like I am. For years I've said, if you can carry your God around in your pocket, whether it's in your hip pocket or whether it's the little thing you carry in your pocket up here. If you can carry your God around in your pocket, I'm sorry, your God's way too small. (laughs) I need a God that's a lot bigger than I am to take care of me. Because I don't know what it's like for you, but I tend to mess up daily. Is that too honest for you? Like you don't mess up daily? Okay? Okay? We need God, right? Almighty God. Daniel said, I'm not praying to an earthly man. I'm going to pray to the living God. And of course, what did they do? They, they arrested him, found him guilty, and they put him in the lion's den. Darius was upset because this was his man that he believed in. And he realized that he had been tricked by his own people. He was awake all night long. He couldn't stand it. Daniel in the lion's den. Oh, it was driving him crazy. So very early the next morning, he ran down to where they had put Daniel in the lion's den, and he cried out, Daniel, oh man of God who serves your God daily, has your God been able to save you? And he waited. And this voice came back. Fear not, O king. But God sent his angels. Shut up the mouth of the lions. Because God knew I was innocent. (laughs) God answered prayer again. See, prayer works. Daniel was a man of prayer And prayer works. This wasn't the first time Daniel had seen an answer to prayer. You read Daniel. Daniel was a man of prayer that had a history of answered prayer. Going all the way back to when he was taken captive as a a war prisoner and forced into this indoctrination center. And he would not compromise in the indoctrination center. And God answered his prayer. And he and 
His three buddies were 10 times better than all the others. God answered his prayer when King Nebuchadnezzar had a dream and no one could interpret the dream. No one could tell him the dream and interpret the dream. And so he was going to have all of his wise men, all of his soothsayers, all the Chaldeans, all of the, all of the, the warlocks. He was going to have them all killed. And Daniel heard about it. And Daniel sent word, tell the king to wait. Daniel went to prayer. God gave him the dream and the interpretation of the dream and that saved not only Daniel's life, it saved the life of all of the others. This is, what an incredible man of integrity. He wasn't just thinking about himself. Even though they were ungodly spiritists and magicians and, and, uh, and soothsayers, he didn't want their life taken. He, he was sparing their life as well. Church, that ought to tell us something what God wants us to be doing. When... Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah refused to compromise, again refusing to be a part of emperor worship and worshiping the gold image, and they were thrown into the flaming, fiery furnace. Answer to prayer, here's the Lord Jesus Christ, pre-incarnate Lord Jesus Christ, in there dancing and celebrating with him in the middle of the fire. Nebuchadnezzar goes, are you kidding me? Get out of there. They came out, didn't even have the smell of smoke on their clothes because God had answered prayer again. Prayer works. Again, the king had another dream, right? No one could interpret it. Daniel prayed. God gave him the dream and gave him the interpretation of the dream. A new king was on the throne, Belshazzar. And he had taken all of the gold items from the temple and was using them in a drunken brawl and an orgy and mocking it and, and praising the gods of the Babylonians. And a hand appears and writes on the wall, Mene, Mene, Tekel, Upharsin. No one could interpret it. Daniel prayed. God gave him the interpretation. I mean, I could just keep telling you answers to prayer for Daniel over and over. The whole book of Daniel is filled with Daniel praying and Daniel getting answers to prayer because, dear ones, prayer works. Amen. God's not changed. He still answers prayer today. Jesus was a man of prayer. There was times he'd go off alone and spend the whole night in prayer. After one of his prayer sessions, his disciples came to him. This is recorded for us in the Gospel of Luke, chapter 11. They go to him, the disciples go to Jesus, and they go, Jesus, teach us to pray the way John taught his disciples. Talking about John the Baptist. Lord, teach us to pray. Because see, prayer is not caught. I, I think oftentimes that we think because someone receives Jesus into their heart, they're going to automatically learn how to pray. But no, prayer is taught. Just the same way that you teach your children how to talk when they're born. Each of our three kids, from the time they they started talking, we began having them memorize. We'd start with Psalm 23. And I, I remember our, our oldest for a long time when she would quote Psalm 23, she'd say it this way, the Lord, the Lord is my, is my shepherd, shepherd, I shall, I shall, not want, not want. <laughs> she thought she was supposed to say it twice because we'd say it and she would say it. And that's how she memorized it. We'd say it, she would say it. So she'd just say it twice. <laughs> oh, I would that all of us would do that. But we had to teach her. We had to teach all three of our children. And we taught them how to pray. One of the ways we taught them how to pray was we kept a prayer journal so that they could see God answered prayer. And we would put it in the prayer journal and then we would put the date it was answered. Remember one time, 
How many here have raised boys? Let me see your hand. You've raised boys. What's it like trying to keep shoes on a boy? That in itself is a miracle, if you could do that. We were needing shoes, as we always were needing shoes. We didn't, we didn't have money to buy shoes. And we were invited to dinner one time, and we put it on our prayer list. Pray, Aaron needs shoes. We, began, we put it on our prayer list. We were praying. We've been praying over it. I forget how long we've been praying for it. It wasn't all that long. And we were invited to dinner. A new family in our church, in our church invited us to dinner. They were, they were career army. And uh, we, after dinner, we're sitting around. We're chatting. And the wife goes, I wouldn't want to offend you, but I was at the BX the other day, and they had a sale on Nike shoes and I just couldn't resist because the sale was so good. But the shoes don't fit my son. Do you, would it offend you if we gave them to you? Maybe they would fit Aaron. And we go, go ahead and offend us with new Nike shoes. <laughs> and you know what happened, right? They fit perfectly. And so he's, got, he's, he's going around wearing brand new Nike shoes we'd never be able to afford to wear because God answered prayer. Another thing on our prayer list at that time was we needed a new roof on our house. We had a bid from a roofer to repair it and some of the, some of the uh, structural things needed to be done as well and it was going to be a lot of money and we didn't have the money for that. We put it on our prayer list, and we had been praying over it. And I went to the office one day. My bookkeeper called me and goes, Pastor, you need to step in here a minute. So I stepped in. She said, look at this. And she said, this envelope was on my desk. And there's nothing else except it says for Pastor Dean. And she opened it, and there was the exact amount in cash what we needed for the repair for our roof. So I quickly went to the phone and told Wanda, I said, tell the kids I got a surprise when we get home. Of course, you know how kids are. As soon as I walked in there, what's the surprise? I went, I'll tell you at dinner. What's the surprise? I'll tell you at dinner. We said, now what's the surprise, Dad? I'll tell you in a minute. What's the... <laughs> I was being mean. <laughs> I reached in my pocket, took out the envelope, and I said, the exact amount of money we need to repair our roof. Amen. And we, just, we taught our children to pray because we wanted them to know prayer works. Would you say that with me? Prayer works. And so Jesus, responding to the disciples, he gave them three things immediately. It's recorded for us in Luke 11. Look at these three things that he gave them, okay? He gave them a prayer model We're going to come back to that in a moment. He gave them the assurance, not only that prayer works, giving them a prayer model, but then he told them, be persistent. Be persistent. Don't give up. Then the third thing that he gave to them, be persistent. Then he said, pray with confidence. Pray with confidence. Be persistent. Don't quit, no matter how long it takes. Don't quit. Remember Wanda saying to me one day, you think dad will ever be saved? She'd been praying at that time. She'd been praying 25 years for her dad. You think dad will ever be saved? I said, we got to believe, dear. God answers prayer. And as I was telling her that, I was remembering what George Mueller said one time, the man who lived totally by faith, ran several orphanages around the world by faith. A news reporter asked him one time when he had landed in Newfoundland from Great Britain, a news reporter as he was getting off the ship asked him, said, Mr. Mueller, has there ever been a time when God has not answered your prayer? And he turned to him and he said, never. That was his word, never. Then he said this. He said, but I have been praying for the son of a friend of mine and he's not saved yet, but he's going to be. That friend came to salvation when George Mueller preached the funeral of his friend. That man came to salvation. 
I told Wanda, we just got to keep praying. It was only like, I think if I'm remembering correctly, it was like three years later or five years later that Al came to Jesus on his deathbed, received Jesus as Lord and Savior before he passed away. See, God answers prayer. Prayer works, but we've got to be persistent. Don't quit. Here's the third thing he said, was he said to them, pray with great confidence. Ask, it'll be given you. Seek, and you shall find. Knock, and it shall be opened to you. But he gave us the prayer model so that we would know how to pray. Let's look at that real quickly, and then we're going to wrap up. The first thing he says is, when you pray, say, Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Prayer starts with authentic worship and adoration to our heavenly Father. To our heavenly Father. Jesus said, when you pray, pray to the Father. In the name of Jesus, we're going to pray to the Father, but we're going to start by giving adoration to him. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Have you ever considered the names of God? The Bible opens with, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The word there for God is the Hebrew word Elohim. El, the most common Semitic name for God whether it's used for idols or whether it's used for the living God, El. But Elohim, Elohim is plural. Not because there are many gods, but because there's one God who has manifested himself in three persons, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Jesus is baptized in the Jordan River by John the Baptist, Heavenly Father, and heaven says, this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. Jesus, the son, has just been baptized. And then here comes Holy Spirit descending in the form of a dove. One God eternally existing in three persons. And so the Bible opens with, in the beginning, Elohim created the heavens and the earth. Later in that creation account, it says, and let us make man in our own image. Not many gods, one God, but manifested in three persons. And his very first name reflects that, Elohim. And then in chapter 14, he's Elion, God most high, God who is supreme. There is no God like him. There has never been another God beside him. All the gods of the nations are idols, but our God made the heavens and the earth. The Lord God most high, supreme. Then next he reveals himself as El Shaddai, the God who is enough. Abraham, fear not, for I am thy shield and thy exceeding great reward. He is El Shaddai, the God who is enough. Oh, God, I can't handle this. God is enough. Oh, God, I don't see how this is wrong. God is enough. This is absolutely impossible. God is enough. El Shaddai, our God is enough. He is sufficient to everything you will ever need. Our God is enough. Come on, give him praise. Then he, he's, he reveals himself as Jehovah Jireh. My God, the supplier. <laughs> Paul said it this way in the New Testament. My God shall supply all your needs according to his riches in glory. Oh, you just missed a really good spot to shout praise right there. Here we go. <laughs> I'll say it again because you missed it. My God shall supply all your needs according to Bank of America. Oh, no. According to Wells Fargo. No, no, no. According to the government bailout check. See, that's 
humanism. I'm so glad my God operates by a divine heavenly bank and he owns the cattle on a thousand hills and the wealth in every mine. And my God is supplying my needs according to his riches in glory. Come on, amen? Amen. 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 He's Jehovah Jireh. Ah, see, see. And then I'm skipping forward. And he says to Moses, you tell them I am that I am. Amen. See, he's the, he's the self-existent one. All other gods had to be made. Somebody had to carve out the wood and then paint the face on it. Or somebody had to chisel out the stone. Or somebody had to paint the picture. All other gods are handmade. But the living God, Elohim, Elion, El Shaddai, Jehovah Jireh, He is I am. He is the self-existent one. He is before all things, and He will be there when all things come to an end. He is the Alpha. He is the Omega. He is the first. He is the last. He is from everlasting to everlasting. He is the self-existent God. He is the great I Am. That is the God we pray to. That is the God we worship. Hallelujah. Give Him glory. Hallelujah. Praise you, Almighty God. Our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Prayer starts with worshiping and glorifying Almighty God. And then the next step is, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Start off by praying, God, your will, your will. God, your will. You you have a will for my life that you wrote in the book before I was ever born. Psalm 139. Thine eyes did behold my substance, yet being imperfect, when as yet there was none of them. In thy book were all my members written. See, God has a book. He knows your name. He knows how tall you're going to be. He knows your hair color. He knows the color of your eyes. He knows whether you're going to be born Asian, whether you're going to be born Indian, whether you're going to be born black, whether you're going to be born Caucasian. He knows everything about you. And he has a will for your life. That's why it says, according as he hath chosen us before the foundation of the world. See, he has all written in a book. But he gives us a self-will because he wants us to love him and worship him because we choose to love him and worship him. And so it needs to be our prayer every day. God, your will be done in my life. Help me to know your will and to walk out your will. Lord, your will be done in my life. But not only in my life. Lord, each circumstance, your will be done. You're facing a problem on the job. Rather than getting angry and frustrated and yelling and banging stuff and throwing stuff and throwing a temper tantrum, why don't you just pause and say, God, your will. What, what's going on here? What, help me see. What are you wanting done here? And it is amazing when you will pause and pray, your kingdom come, your will be done in this, Lord, that suddenly clarity will come and you will see things you hadn't seen before and you'll know just how to fix it. Or you, or you will know where to get 
the person that can fix it. He will bring the solution when you'll pray his will into it. You, you've got a son or a daughter that's going sideways, and it doesn't matter what you say, they're just not listening, and it doesn't matter how much you've disciplined them, they're just not listening. You need to stop and start praying, Almighty God, your will into their life. And whatever it takes, God, work your will in their life. Whatever it takes. How many times I've said to a, to a parent when they have had a son that was just, it was just going to go where they were going to go. They said, what do we do? I said, it's time to turn them over to God. Start praying every day. God, your will in their life. And whatever it takes, God, whatever it takes. Whatever it takes. And I said, and you stop standing between them, Mom. Because mamas, we, we're so, we so want our boys, our little boys. He's six foot tall, but our little boys. <laughs> you got to step out of the way and let God bring his will. Come on, let God be God. Amen. There's just times you just got to let God, your kingdom come, your will be done. When he's talking about your kingdom come, he's talking about God's authority becoming involved in earthly situations. God's authority becoming involved in earthly situations. Folks, we need that right now. We need to start praying. Father, your kingdom come, your will be done in the White House. Your will be done in the Senate. Your will be done in the Congress. Please, God, your will be done in Queen Brown's heart. God, your will be done in Salem. Your will be done in our city council. Your will be done in our county commissioners. Your will be done in our neighborhood. Your will be be done in my home. Amen. And then he says, give us our provision. Father, give us our provision. Father, forgive me of my silliness and my sinfulness. Father, forgive me. God, you're, please bring your forgiveness to me. Father God, protect me from the evil one. Lead me not into temptation, but deliver me from evil. And then here we go, worship again. For thine is the kingdom and the glory forever and ever. See, the prayer model is perfect. We just got to pray. Amen. Would you stand with me, please? Prayer works. We are so blessed that you join us online today. For more resources on how you can grow your relationship with Jesus Christ, visit us online at www.winacity.com. If you would like to speak with someone about your relationship with Jesus Christ or would like prayer, you can contact us at 541-567-4486 or email us at info at